Thank you. Uh, with Eric's permission, I, I did kind of bastardize the, the title and topic of this a little bit. Um, the, the, the title assigned to me was would, would, would uh, ask me to really make an economic argument uh, against uh, uh, generalizing or, or expanding the indication of TAVI toward lower risk patients. And I chose not to do that because I, I don't think that is ultimately going to be uh, a, a major issue and it's not going to be what, uh, what's going to prevent potentially premature um, indication creep toward, toward low risk patients with TAVI. Of course, uh, the valves price now is 28000 versus $2,500. That is a big difference. But as procedural costs are coming down well, with our um, conscious sedation uh, protocols, more valves coming out on the market, uh, next day discharge, cost is not what's going to be preventing us in the near future from, from considering lower risk patients. So I really want to kind of take this as more of a, a cautionary uh, philosophical uh, uh, argument against, uh, against uh, low risk patients in 2017. Not everybody here knows uh, Jimmy. Uh, and so I just wanted to kind of um, point out the irony that he is, that in this debate he's being asked to argue a side that really if, if comes to fruition is going to make him busier. Uh, I don't think Jim, Jimmy has any time to be busier. Um, I've, I've known him for 15 years. <clears throat> he was our proctor for when we started TAVI, and, uh, and I know what it's like to try and get a hold of this guy. Uh, for the, those who don't know him, I kind of put together a pictorial representation of Jimmy's lifestyle and his time management. In the bottom corner here, you know, he's occasionally seen in Hamilton or Niagara, uh, inserting coronary stents or putting in the occasional valve. But you try and get a hold of this guy, and his secretary tells you, I'm sorry, Jimmy's in South Beach. Okay, I'll wait. Uh, Jimmy and his wife are uh, at Whistler Black Home taking a week of uh, ski lessons. Okay, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll wait. Jimmy's in Barcelona. You just missed him. He's in Quebec. Jimmy's flying this afternoon to Boston to be with his wife. Jimmy's in Greece for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> when you do finally get a hold of him and you, you want to ask him a procedural question, he instead wants to talk to you about the latest and greatest restaurant or the best spa in your neighborhood. <laughs> so Jimmy, <laughs> really, you don't have time for this. Where are we at in 2017? That no one is going to argue that, that, uh, that the burden of evidence is already adequate, that high-risk patients, inoperable patients, uh, the super high risk, it's the appropriate intervention, case closed. 2017, we're starting to sniff at intermediate risk patients. We have the partner two in Sertavi trials. It's early, it's intriguing, uh, we're there. But we're not at low risk patients. I, I wish I had uh, Mark's audio of the crickets. TAVI is a fantastic intervention for the very elderly and for the very high risk. We don't need any more data to know this. I mean, five years of follow-up in this po patient population is adequate. Why? 100% of them are dead at five years, right? Do nothing and 94% are dead. Uh, nearly three-quarters of them with a the device are dead too, but you're still only needing to treat five patients at one or at five years to keep them trucking around their nursing home. So we got that indication solidly <laughs> in our back pocket, right? And we all feel great about that. <laughs> so let's, let's move toward the intermediate risk. Partner two in Sir Tavi. Yes, this is quote unquote intermediate risk, but they're still very old patients. They're still on average over 80 years of age. And the, the follow-up is a whopping two years. Are we really already thinking the next frontier, like we've got this one, let's move to low risk? I don't think so. This is where I, I think it's a bit, of, a, bit, a bit of a philosophical thing about us and our profession, us as interventionists. When there's a standard of care, we should demand that we have convincing data that we can match or beat it before we really start applying the new therapy to our patients outside of randomized trials. And we have a bad history of this in our at least in the adult interventional community. And a, and a great example of that is angioplasty in diabetics with multivessel disease. How many hundreds of thousands of patients have we treated with angioplasty uh, that, that we took 20 years of clinical trials to ultimately decide we shouldn't be doing this, right? 
a limit to the LED is a great operation. We can't, we are unable to beat it with angioplasty. And why is it different for de procedures and devices than medications, right? We would not prescribe a new drug for an indication that has a well-established gold standard until we have a huge burden of clinical trials and vigorous programs to prove that, we, that, that it's time to move on to the next thing. Interventions, for some reason, our interventions are different. Is it because we're the gatekeepers? We diagnose and we decide what to do? Do we overvalue the advantage of and benefit of our interventions? Uh, when we diagnose a problem and we have our own fix, it's very hard to resist applying that fix. There are financial incentives to what we do and we can't really realistically dissociate that from it. We love our technologies and we celebrate our successes. Industry drives our trials. <clears throat> and it's easy to sell patients on interventions that are, are more invasive and, and steer them away from what are perceived to be older procedures. So the problem in low-risk patients is that there is a gold standard and it's fantastic, right? A SAVR in a, in a, in a low-risk patient is a great operation. We've known for 20 years we've had registries showing very low risks and rates of <coughs> uh, structural valve deterioration. And as Jimmy was showing you, we're on to clinical trials already, like the PARTNER3 trial is in low-risk patients and is randomizing patients uh, with STS scores of four or less to, to TAVI or to surgery. <clears throat> Conceivably, we'll be sitting in, in meeting halls in a, a year or two looking at results that are one year post-procedure. Oops. So when is a non-inferior trial truly non-inferior? It's not going to be at one or two years. Short-term follow-up is not enough when you're talking about younger and healthier patients. Certainly not when we have such a well-proven standard of care. We must remember that many surgical valves looked great at five years and then started falling apart before 10 years. And Danny DeVere's recent data uh, presented on, on longer-term uh, structural integrity of TAVI valves is sobering. There's 94% freedom of structural valve deterioration at four years but it fell to 82% at six years and an estimated 50% at eight years. Yes, older valves, but definitely cautionary. And what we don't know about longer term structural integrity could hurt us. Moreover, the pacemaker rates, 25% pacemaker rates, which are four times higher than with surgical valves, is not without consequence. Younger patients, that's going to have effects on their symptoms and their exercise tolerance, and certainly we know that it has adverse effects on long-term, uh, adverse long-term effects on LV function. What about the cost and the complexity of surgical reinterventions in patients with TAVI valves? We can't simply say, we'll do a TAVI inside TAVI in 10 or 15 years. A lot of those patients, that won't be an option, and, and how much more complex are surgical interventions with, with scarred in um, TAVI valves? Some early indications are that it's a disaster. What about the longer term consequences of significantly more aortic insufficiency? Uh, maybe it's not moderate or severe, but it's mild and carry mild aortic insufficiency uh, over many years. What are the effects of that? And of course, more recently, concerns about leaflet thrombosis and the potential need for anticoagulation in these TAVI valves. So all of these are significant issues that we need clarity on from the populations of patients we're already treating before we start pushing the intervention toward the younger and healthier populations who have a longer horizon of risk. So in 2017, are we really ready for TAVI and low-risk patients? Jimmy, where do you want to spend more time? In here or with your friends? <laughs> so keep calm, hold your horses. We're not ready for low-risk patients. 